Hello and welcome to the Hoover Institution's 2014 Southern California Conference. I'm Chris Dower, Hoover's Director of Marketing and Strategic Communications. Our speaker in this chart cast is David Brady, the Davies Family Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution. The title of his talk is The 2014 Congressional Elections in Historical Perspective, and it was recorded on October 2nd, 2014. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk, uh, I think, some uh, rather interesting uh, things are going on in uh, American elections uh, that, are out, that are out of the ordinary. So the first, so the first thing uh, I want to talk about is there are um, many claims BBC, uh, American government is broken, doesn't work. There are lots of reasons for it. We have divided government. We have uh, Rule 22 in the Senate. The Republican Party features prominently in that. That's why it won't work, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I looked at, uh, so I wanna, what, what does it mean when you say the government doesn't work? Because I just uh, spent time at Sciences Po in France, and uh, it struck me that if our government wasn't working, what, what would we say about France? Um, so, so this is uh, a table. So I went to the IMF fund, IMF uh, data, and so this uh, looks at the, um, well, these pointers are useless for old people like me. Um, you can't see it. So uh, what well, I basically, this table just shows that if you compare the United States to the uh, advanced countries from 2008 to 2014, the advanced G20 companies in the Euro areas on everything, real GDP, unemployment, hourly earnings, productivity, unit labor costs here, it's reversed, so the unit labor cost goes up, it's an advantage, growth in employment, and inflation, the United States is surely not at the bottom of that. In fact, now that's not to say that the United States under different policies couldn't have grown more. I'm simply saying that if you look at the data, if the United States government is broken, then where are all these other countries? And you know, when the Italians get stuck and they're in a recession and haven't recovered from 2008, 2009, you can't blame it on the Republican Party or Rule 22. They don't have a Republican Party, and they don't have Rule 22. So my view is that uh, something else must be going on because none of these other governments are, are kind of solving the problem. And so what I want to suggest is that, um, by analogy, that what's happening in the United States is what happened in the United States in an earlier period, and that as you get this global transformation of the economy, as you now go with China and India. So the first transformation occurred roughly and started in Great Britain and the United States after the Civil War. In that industrial era, that covered about one, third, one quarter to one third of the world. This transformation is much bigger. This covers between two thirds and three quarters of the world with China and India now involved. When that happens, the same set of issues occurs. Banking, free flow of capital, too much money going to uh, banking. There is uh, the issue of inequality. There is the issue of immigration. All of those sorts of issues came up the first time and they're back here again at the same time. And the problem is that each country, in order to stay competitive, has to jack up its workforce, has to jack up the educational system. This includes China as well. I read uh, a wonderful story, wasn't really so wonderful. I read a story the other day that showed that um, those printers that do uh, 3D printers will cost the Chinese 15 to, 30, 000, 15 to 30 million jobs in the next 15 years. So in other words, they're not going to need people on any assembly line. In order for the Chinese to keep up, they're going to have to have people who run those machines, the programmers, et cetera, they'll have jobs. Adjusting to the changes in the U.S. economy and the world economy are exceedingly difficult. They're particularly difficult for the United States. They're difficult for the United States for a couple of reasons. One, the United States has special military obligations. In spite of what some of the press might think, the United States, if when, when the, the Straits of Hormuz that keep the oil flowing all around the world, that's the responsibility of the United States. When the Chinese step into the China South Sea, the Vietnamese communist government 
pleads with the United States to pivot to the East, get involved, help them out against their fellow communists. So the United States has very special military obligations around the world. And secondly, providing jobs in a world in which uh, global warming and environmental concerns are certainly, whether you agree or not, they're of political relevance. That makes it even more difficult. Say the European Union, which has very high standards for automobiles, they have just repealed their 2020 standards because they know that if they keep those high standards, their European automobile industry will uh, continue to falter. So they've had to drop them. So my point is very simple. We live in very hard economic times where there's lots of adjustments. Those adjustments are hard, and all around the world, democratic governments, capitalist democratic government systems are not solving that problem. Now, I'm not, of course, going to give you an answer uh, to that, of course. Uh, I'll leave that to the following speakers. Um, uh, and since I won't hear them, I'll assume they're all right. Um, so, uh, this, so what I want to do is show you how that affects, uh, how that affects elections. So um, if you look at, um, in 2004, the Republicans had uh, control of the House, Senate, and the presidency. They just won their second election in a row. The president of the United States said, I've got political capital, I'm gonna spend it. He sent up some stuff about privatizing Social Security. You remember how that went. And in a 2010 interview, he said, well, I guess we didn't really have that much capital. 2006, you, uh, big, victory for the, uh, big victory for the Democrats, they take the House and the Senate. Then you get 2008, the president, House, and Senate are all Democratic, and James Carville then writes that all-time bestseller, how the, Republic, how the Democrats will dominate American politics for the next generation. Now, that book already, within, and within two years, generations are apparently shorter than they used to be, because by uh, 2010, that had reversed itself. Carville's book uh, has sales now like many of mine. Uh, but, but I got tenure for mine, and he didn't. Um, and, then, and then, of course, 2010 was a huge switch to the Republicans. And, and frankly, with uh, better candidates, the Republicans would have had the Senate in 2010. 2012 was simply a repeat of 2010. And 2014, which we'll get to, there's no one question the House of Representatives. So again, you have the, so there's a lot of flip-flopping. A lot of flip-flopping, a lot of promising. What's the only other time the U.S. looked like that? This is from 1874 to 1896. I have to remind my students that I personally was not present at that time. Uh, remember, the Stanford freshmen were born in 1996. So they kind of want to know why Bill Clinton gets any play. Why, why isn't it Hillary? Because they have no idea who he is. Um, so at any rate, you can see that during this time period, there's that same flip-flopping. Republican, Democrat, RDR, you get one period, 1880, you get there, and then it flips, it flips. 1888, you get uh, three, uh, all, all controlled by the Republican, and then it's immediately gone in 1890. And during that time, the flipping on the issues was the issues were the same. They were banking. Uh, the issues were inequality, immigration, too many foreigners. The same, basically, there's an eerie, if you go back and read that, there's an eerie sense in which you're reliving at present, uh, at present you're reliving what, what went on then. And I'm saying the issues were the same, smaller then, actually a little easier to solve because the United States now is the leader. And in the 1890s, all the United States had to do was choose to get on board what was happening uh, globally. So, so, that's, so this era of indecision makes congressional elections a little bit different. Now this is a, um, uh, this, this is a, a compilation of uh, about 1,200 Gallup polls from 1937 to the present. And um, it took us a long time to collect. This is a data set unique to um, Hoover Institution, my colleagues. Uh, of course, the work was uh, mainly done by graduate students, but um, sorry, we supervised them. Um, so, so the point is, the blue line is that this is party identification over uh, the period 1937 to the present. And uh, I can't point to that, but you can see 
that are coming out of the New Deal, the Democrats had a big lead. Uh, that lead increased, if you follow the line, it increased, uh, it increased uh, starting in 58 with the recession, 64 through the Goldwater years, the Democrats lead on the top, starts to slump, 68, but then uh, the ne after Watergate, it goes back up. But, uh, and the Democrat, the Republican percentage continues to drop, so there's huge gaps. And it's not until 1984, 85, that you get the present system, which I call party parity. Basically, the gap between Democrats and Republicans, as you can see there, is quite small, and now independents. So there's been two things. Uh, a decline in Democratic Party identification. Also, from the start of the series, the Republicans have declined, but they've declined less, so the gap between Democrats and Republicans is quite narrow, and there's been a rise in independents. Given parity along these lines, it seems to me it makes it even more difficult. It's both sides believe that they can, with the next election, govern, uh, set up something like a realignment and govern for a, for a, a long enough period. So you get the comment Bush in 2004, uh, you get the comment in 2008 by Carville, and it doesn't happen. And the point is, as long as no party has an answer to that question or no government sees continual progress, like you did under the Reagan years, then you're not going to get a solution to that. The parties are in parity, and that makes every election contested exceedingly important, and I'll show you some more of the facts. But remember, this takes place, uh, these elections take place in the context of party parity, which means Republicans are now much more competitive in House and Senate elections than they were. From 1937 till 84, uh, you know, the United States Congress was controlled by the Republicans exactly twice, 1946 and 1952. Since then, Republicans have dominated the House, and as you know, the Senate's about even. I mean, not even in that way, but even. So what, what's the other thing that's happened? Well, there's all this talk about polarization, but I don't really believe that what's happened is polarization. I think it's sorting. So imagine the Democrats at time one, they have 50 liberals, 25 moderates, and 25 conservatives. At time two, they have 125 libs, and, uh, and, the, and, the Democrat, and the Republicans over there started with 25, 25, and 50, but now they have 125 conservatives. That would be polarization. There's, a, there's liberals. Here's, but what's actually happened is this. The parties have sorted themselves. So at time one, the Democratic Party had 50 liberals, 25 moderates, 25 conservatives. So there were a bunch of southern and border state conservatives that were Democrats. There were some moderates like Jim Jones and people like that from Oklahoma. Uh, and at time two, what's, and that, so the Republicans had uh, 25 liberals. It's nice to be able to talk to a group who actually might remember who Clifford Case was, Nelson Rockefeller, Bill Scranton. But the point is, there were some moderate to liberal Republicans. The point is, now they're gone. And so the Democratic Party is now 75 libs and 25 moderates, and the Republican Party is 75 conservatives and 25 moderates, and in the middle, there's sort of 50 moderates, those are the independents. And they're going to decide, and the point is, in a party parity system, they're going to decide elections. So think of the 2006 election as, as the independents, those moderate people in the middle saying, all right, enough of the war, we're tired of that. And it, very quickly in the Obama administration, by 2010, you can view those people as standing up and saying, all right, enough Affordable Care Act, enough of cap and trade, we're, we're not that liberal. So, uh, and the interesting thing is that this is not ideological in the sense that if you sort of look at average self-identified ideology, you ask Americans, do you generally consider yourself liberal, conservative, or moderate? Uh, liberals have always been the lowest, that's the blue line. Uh, moderates, uh, there are more moderates, and uh, conservatives have always had sort of a, a lead on them, but there's been no, no if, in other words, if it was polarization, you expect those lines to go like that, but that hasn't happened. Americans have not really shifted. So the difference, it's really important to understand the difference between sorting and polarization. Just the Democratic Party doesn't have any conservatives, and the Republican Party doesn't have any liberals anymore. So uh, if you look at party ID, by, it's often mentioned that, well, if you include leaners, people who lean Democrat and lean Republican, well, you can see that the same thing, the same thing happens. There's been no great change in the ideology uh, by party. Now, again, uh, this, is the, uh, this is the average abortion position. 
uh, by Democrats, Republicans, and uh, you can see the Democrats, Republicans, and Independents there. And again, note that there's not a tremendous amount of difference, but sort of post-2004, you are starting to get some differences in that. But again, nothing, nothing like you would actually expect if there was true polarization where it'd be just at both ends. And this is the same thing by five-point uh, party ID. And the reason we put that in is because a lot of, when you sometimes make an argument like we're making, people say, well, if you take five-point party ID, people, leaners are really, leaners, that's just, they're really just like, leaning Democrat is like being a Democrat. Leaning Republican is like being Republican. But it's not true. You can see that the leaners are always more moderate than the strong, than the strong party guys. So now, uh, here's the uh, American National Election Studies defection rate in House elections. I guess uh, what's important on this is you can see that in the 60s, 70s, that there's, 60, there's 64 with Goldwater. Uh, there's 72. There's, you can see 72 as a drop. But by defections, it means that uh, the people in the parties uh, vote for uh, someone of the other party. So the high, so at least 30%, if you go into the mid period, the square black box means that 30% of all people who said they were Republican would vote for a Democrat in the House. And you can see that uh, into the 90s and 2000s, there are large numbers of Republicans who said they would vote for, or Democrats, rather, who said they voted for a Republican House candidate. Now you can see that those numbers recently have fallen off. That's the sorting process. Now, there are very, very few moderate districts. There's very, very few swing districts. And part of the reason for that, and when there aren't any swing districts, what happens is there's no split ticket voting. And again, this is leaners, same thing. As you can see, leaners were much more likely to def if you said, I'm a, I'm a Democrat, but I lean Democrat, or I'm a Democrat, but I lean, or I'm a Republican, but I lean Republican, then the point is that they had an even higher defection. And again, even among them, the defection rate is now uh, around 10%. And among party people, it's, it's uh, less. And so when you don't have defection among partisans, then it's the middle that decides, that decides elections. And so then, then the question is, there's all this stuff. So if you read, if, so if, you've, if, you, uh, if you read the news, if you follow television, they do a litany of things about the election that I'm not going to do. I have them all here if you want to see them. They say, what's the generic vote? If the election were held tomorrow, who would you vote for? Republicans are slightly ahead. How popular is the president? Well, not very popular. How it's the data of the country. So they put all those things together, and that's a predictive model where you just take everything you can, throw it in, run a regression on it, say this is what'll happen. So I'm, I'm not interested in doing that, uh, because the more important thing that determines these elections is partisan identification. That is, Democrats vote Democrat, Republicans vote Republican, and then you have the question only of who's gonna turn out, and what happens to independent. So now, the normal midterm, 1994, Republican take four. 1988, 98, Democrats gained seats. 2002, Republicans gained seats. 2006, the Republicans got thumped. 2010, Democrats got schlacked. 2014, normal. My point to you is very simple. Given contemporary times, given the set of issues around the world, what's happening is there are no normal elections. There used to be, President's party always loses seats in the midterm. Doesn't happen anymore. And the reason is because of the sorts of things I'm putting up. Now, senators lose more often uh, than House of Representatives. The top line is House incumbent. So if you, just, if you want to know one thing about a House election, ask, is there an incumbent? If there's an incumbent, you can pretty well predict they're going to win. Senate incumbents generally don't do as well. But now you can note, toward the end, uh, the last six to eight years, they're, they're kind of coming together. Now, Democratic uh, Senate, Senate incumbents, rather, do, do less well, because uh, if you're going to try and get an incumbent in a House race, California's got over 50 seats in the House, hard to get candidates. But with the Senate, there's only one person up at a time. Generally, they get a better opponent, and their opponent raises more money. So senators generally are less safe than House members. 
And here's one of the things I just pointed out. Here's the incumbent Democrats' advantage. The blue line uh, is simply uh, average incumbent, amount of money they raised. And so in 2012, they spent, average incumbent had uh, spent over $11 million. And, uh, but you can see the gap is the average uh, challenger was still pretty high at about $6 million. Now look at the difference between that and the House. In the Senate, I mean, in the House, the average incumbent spending about 1,700,000, and the average challenger is uh, at about 500,000, and most of that was wasted. Um, you, don't beat, you don't beat House incumbents, uh, and therefore, they don't raise much money. Money's not stupid. Money, it, it, when you go around, you know, when they see the presidential races early, when people give their report on how much have they raised, the reason they're doing that is people have a lot of money, they, they want to put their money, they want to back somebody who has a chance of winning. And in house seats, the gap is just too great because you can't, you can't win. Now, here's another one about uh, money, very, very simple one. This is money in the 2006 house races. And uh, here's the money was spent by Clay Shaw, $7 million. Pombo in California uh, spent uh, over $7 million. Uh, Nancy Johnson in Connecticut sent $6 million. That was a bad year for Republicans. All of them lost. So if you're an incumbent and you got a real challenger, what do you do? You spend the money you have. But having the money doesn't mean you win, okay? Because 2006 was one of those wave elections. And here's the same thing in 2010. This is always very useful to show undergrads because they, they absolutely believe if you have more money, you win. You win the election. And, and you can see in this case, you don't. So all the, all the figures in dark, Grayson, uh, Murphy, uh, Klein, they all spent millions and millions of dollars, much more than their opponent, and they did not get elected. So money, you got to have enough money to compete, but money by itself, actually, given that Meg Whitman spent $147 million and got about 41% of the vote, I don't think I should have to make that point. Um, okay, so my view is there's uh, very, very sort of congressional election eras. One, there was a pre-Civil War, I wasn't there. 1960s, 1990s, all politics is local. That was Tip O'Neill. That is, elections were local. There was there very little, there were, no, there were no wave elections where it was a referendum on the president. It was all local stuff. And the Democrats controlled the Congress over that entire time period. Not once did they lose. The nationalized eras are 1874, 1910, 1930s. Now, and by a nationalized, I mean Things move together so that if there's a wave, as in 2010 or 1994, the Republicans take over the House, they do, or if there's a wave in 2006, Democrats take over. So by nationalized era, I mean there's swing voting that goes across the country. It's not just local. Okay. So again, another example of that. Split, uh, this is uh, from 1900 to... Uh, the present era, you can see that uh, early on, not this is the progressive era, you get some ticket splitting, but the amount of splitting the ticket, somebody who'll vote for one party at president, the other at house combined, uh, you can see that in the 50s, 60s, that percentage was exceedingly high. That's kind of a local politics issue. You can vote for Eisenhower. Go ahead, vote for Eisenhower. Uh, he's okay. I don't have to support, if you're a Democratic congressman or congresswoman, you say, I'm going to run on the local issues here in Texas. You can vote Democrat here, vote Republican there. It's okay. But now, as you see again, that has dropped off in the recent period, meaning it's harder to do that. You can't say, uh, you can vote for Obama, but then vote for, uh, vote, vote, vote for Obama, but vote, vote for me separately. It's, it's harder to do. Now, here is the most... Um, interesting table, which took us quite a lot of time to put together. If you ask the question, so if you want to know the best predictor of how a candidate would do in a House election, the, top, the block line says, well, how did, how did the vote that the, the incumbent got in the last election, or the incumbent party got, how, does that, how well does that predict the election? So you notice the difference at the beginning of the period. In 1958, it's at 0.9, and the presidential vote predicts that less than, it's a negative. But notice, in the last four, six years, the presidential vote now predicts House elections better than 
the, the vote that the individual candidate got. That is a considerable change. Now, you know, why do I go into all this? Because you can get the crap I'm about to do anywhere. Um, I was predicting the election, you can, you can look up anywhere, but you can't, it seems to me, or, or if you can get this, I'd like to know where you got it, because it took us a long time to, to get that. But that's, that's a very important part. The pres now the vote in the district for the president better predicts House elections than the candidate himself's vote or herself's vote in the last election. That means elections are more national, less local, less ticket splitting, so on. Okay, so uh, this is polarization scores, and what's happening is the lower dotted line is the average Democrat and Republic. What's the difference between the average Democrat and Republic? And you go out and ask somebody, I'm a Democrat or Republican, you ask them the issues, that's the difference. The next level is uh, the people who, uh, the next people, the next, the middle level are party activists. That is, those are people who, you know, knock on doors, uh, do stuff, pass out, pass out flyers, etc. Ten uh, party meetings, and the top line is donors. And people who give money are more ideologically split, and so that means that the money and the juice in the parties uh, tends to come from the left and from the right in the Democratic and Republican parties, respectively. So here's a, here's a, here's a, here's a, a distribution of uh, le very liberal on the left to very conservative of people who don't donate money. Pretty, pretty normally uh, distributed, a uh, few more people on the conservative side. Uh, but of donors who give less than 200, note how polarized it is, left and right, and of donors who give more than $200, it's actually a little less polarized, and that's probably because businesses, uh, particularly Wall Street, gives to both sides. Uh, whenever. Now, Hollywood, we're, I guess we're close to it here. Um, Hollywood is not. If that was Hollywood, it would be all on the uh, Democratic side. There's about $8 from, no, there's a little more than that from Hollywood, but not much. And now, again, uh, when, when you have this, when you have this party system that is at parity and elections can flip rather quickly, what happens is it's easy to get money from, it used to be when uh, 50, 40, 50 years ago uh, that most of the money in a house election or a governor's election came from in state. But now notice what you can see in these elections as you move out the amount outside group spending in House and Senate elections is ratcheting way up. And the reason it's ratcheting up is because on this party parity system, what happens in Colorado or what happens in uh, Kansas or what happens in Louisiana matters a lot. And so the money flows from outside the state. All of those are different from congressional elections as they have been for 50 or 60 years. Finally, okay. So, um, wh where do these predictions come from? So, my hip pocket. No. Uh, so, our colleague uh, Doug Rivers. How am I doing on time? Okay. So, uh, our colleague at Hoover um, Political Science at Stanford, Doug Rivers. Uh, he's an uh, entrepreneur, he's founded three companies, but the uh, two, last two he founded were Knowledge Networks, which is a survey uh, company, and uh, that put, uh, let people do it off TVs in their house. But the most recent one uh, he founded was uh, Polymetrics, which is an internet, uh, internet polling service. And uh, that was then sold to YouGov slash Polymetrics, so when, those of you who read The Economist, all the polls in The Economist are from YouGov slash Polymetrics. Now, in 2012, I'll just tell a little story. So, the advance, so here's two advantages. So one, on the telephone polls that most people do, <clears throat> what happens is um, you have to make 20 calls to get one person agree to accept. 
How many of you have gotten phone calls and I said we'd like to ask you a question? I never answer them. Yeah, you answer them? No. So what happens is they make before they get one person to talk, they get 20. So in 2012, after that first debate, where Romney did very well and Obama didn't do very well, every other poll had Romney suddenly leading in the polls. And when we gave a talk, uh, Doug and I gave a talk at Hoover uh, with about five weeks ago saying, saying that uh, Romney would not win. There were a few sisses. Uh, we had to assure them that we're not talking about how we're both. We're just trying to talk about the data. And the reason we were able to do that was because we had a panel of 30,000 people on the internet. Same people. And so we could survey them before, during, and after the debate, and we got no change. So why were the telephone polls wrong? Because after the first debate, if you were a Democrat, how happy would you have been to talk about the president's performance? So the people who were more willing to talk on the phone were Republicans. So those early samples oversampled Republicans. So on this election, everything I'm about to show you now comes from a panel of 120,000 people who will be, uh, are, are going to do them four times. The data I'm showing you is from the second one. We just finished the third one. I just talked to Doug on the phone about two hours ago, so I can tell you a little about it, but the charts are, are not yet ready. Either that or he wouldn't let me have them. Uh, so here's, here's the key question. The, the, the dark art for presidential election years are great for pollsters because you, you can pretty well tell who's going to turn out and vote. The dark art of... Uh, polling in midterm elections is who the hell is going to vote. And so you can see the turnout, the lower line is the turnout in midterm elections. On average, it's about 14 to 15 points lower than the presidential election. So I know the 2014 electorate won't be like 2012. And moreover, it's particularly a problem for Democrats because key Democratic root groups are less likely to vote. So there, in, this is 2008 versus 10. As you can see, there's a big drop off in uh, young people. People over 65 favor Republicans. Male, about the same female. White, black, Hispanic. So in key Democratic groups, Hispanics, blacks, young people, that's the biggest drop off. So a Democratic strategy is how can we turn them out in the various states? Okay? The Republican strategy has to be how do we make this a, a more of a national election? A referendum on Obama. Okay, so now because we have 120,000 people over 435 districts, with the exception of Alaska, you can't imagine how hard it is to get a sample of 600 people on the internet in Alaska. <laughs> uh, it's unbelievably hard. Uh, you have to fly the computer and drop it off to them, and so, you, you don't. Okay, so this, this is the probability model. So on the left, you have 210 seats, and on the right, you have 270 seats. So on the basis of uh, polling in each district, where, where we have samples on average of about 800 uh, in each congressional district, you can see that uh, what we have, the best probability is that the, Democrat, the Republicans will pick up four to eight seats. Uh, the little bit, the blue way over at the end is the probability that the Democrats would get uh, over 210. So there's, not, there's not, much, not much action here. Though I will say I don't think that the pickup will be over 10 seats. Now, at one point the idea was it could be 8 to 12 seats, maybe something like that. Uh, in the polling we're doing in three key races in Michigan, where we're doing extra polling, uh, the Democrats are ahead in each of those. So. I, I, they're going to pick up seats. My guess is it's more like four, be closer to four than ten. And, and then, you know, to 2016, I'm, you all have forgotten or I won't be back. Uh, so now here's the old Senate forecasts, okay? Here's the old Senate forecast. The old Senate forecast was we'd have 51 seats. The Republican Party would have 51 seats. Now. When you look at that, this, so think of this as a probability distribution because, you know, this is not, you can't, I can't tell you that it's certainty is 0.9 in this election. So this is a probability range of all the outcomes given all the polling and all the interactions, 
what's the likelihood that it would be? And the highest probability, the probability at that time was 51 seats, would be Republican. But that probability was only 18%. On the other hand, uh, the probability that the Democrats would have 50 seats was not much lower. It was about 16. And as you move to the right, it goes down. But you can see, so the, the best guess is you're between, as, as everybody knows, you're between 49, and, and now it's between 49 and 51. Uh, now, that's changed, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. So here are, now everybody doesn't have, so if you, if you, uh, like Wendy Borchard there, get up in the morning and read real clear politics and all that stuff, uh, then you'll see that some people have this different, uh, different than we do. So this is based on, uh, over, again, even with 120, this is the oversampling in these states. So, uh, so we have, a little different, Colorado and New Hampshire as Democratic holes. Some people have them closer. Quinnipiac had... Uh, Quinnipiac had New Hampshire very close. Well, if you believe that poll, so, you know, when they show those polls, it looks like Quinnipiac poll, and boom, it's there. Well, the Quinnipiac poll has 39% uh, of the citizens of uh, uh, New Hampshire are Republican, and only 20% are Democrat. Well, that's nonsense. That's just not true. So they've oversampled uh, Republicans that Democrats, and that's how they got it. So. Uh, our, our polls uh, try, to be, try to get the best, uh, best possible balance. So then uh, I got lean Democrat, lean Democrat. Now we're showing that as much closer than some others. But in our poll, we have 30% uh, African Americans who say they're undecided. So I'm calling that on the grounds that under undecided that in general, African, -American can African Americans are gonna vote Democrat. So when you add that in, I have that. Uh, Georgia, I would now move Georgia into a Republican hold. The gap is about four points and increased. Uh, with, in other words, the same people. We're interviewing 120,000 of the same people, time one, time two, and we just finished the third one, and, uh, and the Georgia lead is up. Uh, Kentucky is also a hold, uh, and that's also increased. Kansas. It's showing closer than uh, we thought it would be, but I can't believe that Kansas is going. Kansas hasn't had a Democratic, uh, Democratic senator since about 1880 or something. I, I, I just can't, I can't believe that Kansas, so I, I'm keeping Kansas where it is. Well, that means that Republicans need six seats to gain control, uh, to gain control, and uh, uh, Toss-ups, Alaska, Arkansas, Iowa, Louisiana, North Carolina. So I think uh, uh, Arkansas will go, uh, will go Republican. Cotton will beat Pryor. Alaska, uh, it's dead, I mean, it's just dead even. You got even closer. And we only have a poll of 600. It's hard to get 600 internet people in Alaska. So it's dead, Iowa's dead even, dead even. And then uh, North Carolina, uh, we're, we have it a little closer than most, but most polls show her with about a one to one and a half, two percent lead. And you can see North Carolina is a state, because North Carolina has the research triangle, et cetera, et cetera. It's a state that over time has gotten less Republican, more Democrat, kind of like Virginia. So, so you can see, uh, so my guess, my best guess is 50-50. Now that, that, can, that can shift, but if you had to say what was the problem, so that table I showed you, the probability 80, the probability of 50-50 is at 20. Uh, and, and, that may, and even if it's 50-49, it won't be decided until December. So even if the Republicans had 50 seats and the Democrats 49, because the Louisiana primary is an open, everybody agrees Landry will, uh, will finish first, but she won't have 50%, so there's a runoff in December. So there, you may not even know until then. Uh, all right, so now here it's a it's an interesting election in the following way. It's a national election. It's a national election for Republicans. That is, uh, so there might percent who say Congress is very important to deciding how to vote. Georgia, Louisiana, North Carolina, Arkansas, Michigan, Kansas. Look at those states. And there it is. They all think it's important because 
there, it's an anti-Obama in those states. So Republic, Democrats, on the other hand, Obama's a factor in the election. So Republicans, yeah. Democrats, oh no. No, Obama, who's that? I don't, I don't know who he is. So as you look in each of these states, about half of it's a national election that Republicans are going to turn out. Democrats are trying to, and have been actually, in my view, quite successful at localizing these elections. One little statistics, Repu statistic. Republicans have gone from 45 to 48 percent of their commercials in Senate races being about the Americans for Affordable Care Act to now under 20 percent. And that's the fact that that's a good sign that the election's being, uh, it's an election about Iowa now. It's not an election about that other stuff. So uh, for the Dem for Republicans, it's a national election. For Democrats, it is a Now here's the enthusiasm gap. So look, every pollster tries to, you do your best to try and figure out who the hell's going to vote. I, I know how you're going to vote. That's not a problem. The question is, are you going to vote? So everybody has their own little tricks and their filters and stuff. But people, registered voters, they, you ask people, are you registered? They, they lie. 20% who aren't registered say they are. People who are registered and said, did you vote? They say yes. Well, that's about an 18% lie. Because we go back and check to see who voted, who didn't. We can't tell how they voted, but we know they didn't vote. They say, oh, yeah, I voted. Then you go back and say, gee, you weren't on the registry. Oh, okay. So, so it's all... I, and, you know, I don't know, it's hard to do. So we try and get at this through enthusiasm. This is our best guess. And this is the, our significant Republican Senate voters. And here's the best chance that if, if that swings from 50 to 51 percent or 51 percent Republican control, it's uh, a, simply a result of this enthusiasm gap, which everywhere but Kansas, um, everywhere but Kansas, uh, the Republicans have the advantage. So... My guess is they're going to be more likely to vote. That's it. For more podcasts from the Hoover Institution, please visit hoover.org or Hoover's channel in iTunes U. I'm Chris Dower for the Hoover Institution. Thanks for listening.